I'm sure they're going to do their due diligence and have some kind of plan about fact-checking or something, but it's going to be an exchange with voters. It's not just Caitlin Collins talking to him. It is an incredible gift to Trump. And because he's back on Fox News after a soft ban, and Mark Levin, you know, months ago was pro-DeSantis, and every time Trump would pick on DeSantis, you know, Mark Levin would be offended and say, this isn't helpful, you know, and would tweet about it. You know, they've all come back around, they've given in, and they're going to give him regular air on Fox. And then this idea that he's going to be on CNN, obviously the most important thing is that it's going to be a huge advantage for Trump. Hi again, everyone. It's five o'clock here in New York in the year 2023, but here we go again, treating Donald Trump like a normal politician, not the insider of an insurrection against our government, the subject, maybe even the target of various investigations across several jurisdictions, the taker of classified information to his private residence, the ally to dictators all across the globe that he actually is. As Donald Trump careens into the 2024 election season, indicted under criminal investigation by DOJ in Fulton County, Georgia, credibly accused of rape in New York, he's lapping up the red carpet being rolled out for him as the leading Republican candidate in early primary states and from some news organizations. It is incumbent on us to ask the question over and over again, are there really two sides to covering the campaign of a coup plotter? As you heard from our dear friend A.B. Stoddard discussing on the Bulwark's podcast, news outlets have reopened their airwaves to Trump, giving him the legitimacy and the airtime he craves. Yet he's already suggested that he won't participate in the Republican presidential debates, a key aspect to our normal and traditional democratic process. He continues to attack anyone and everyone who he thinks wronged him or might in the future. That includes judges simply upholding the rule of law and witnesses who have been subpoenaed to testify in cases against him. Now, while the Republican Party he leads is all too happy to lay down again, follow him down the path of autocracy, transforming the GOP into a party that stands on the other side of democratic norms, as well as a majority of Americans' opinions on gun safety, on voting rights, on reproductive health care. Trump allies have made no secret of their goal to suppress voters, especially young voters and voters of color, only for the fact that they typically vote for Democratic candidates. Republicans in state legislatures have taken pages from Trump's tyrannical playbook, silencing and expelling lawmakers they disagree with. So for those asking as we gear up for the next presidential election season, will it be 2016 all over again? It's clear this is not, because this time we know better, right? We know who he is. We know how he governs. We know what kind of president Donald Trump is. We know he stops at nothing to cling to power. We know he will weaponize the federal government and the institutions he leads to his own benefit. We know all this. We know he'll try to sabotage and destroy his enemies, even the ones in his own government, even his own VP. We know the GOP is fine with it and following him down this path of anti-democratic ways. Democracy on trial for all of us is where we get we begin the hour with some of our favorite reporters and friends. Now, Katyal is here. He's a former acting solicitor general, now a law professor at Georgetown University. Also joining us, the aforementioned and featured A.B. Stoddard, Real Clear Politics associate editor and columnist, and Morgan State University journalism and politics professor Jason Johnson joins us. Neil, I start with you. I, I think some of us, I won't speak for A.B., but I'll speak for myself, We're ready to acknowledge that it is not the role of the rule of law in a democracy to deal with an out-of-control politician. It's the role of that party to police them. When the Republican Party broke down, when Donald Trump saw good people on both sides of a KKK rally, when he threatened and and targeted and bullied the likes of Jim Comey and Rod Rosenstein and Jeff Sessions, um, I think it became clear that the party didn't have the backbone or the appetite to take him on. And so I think the pressure built first on on Mueller, right, for two years. And then it has built for the last two years on Merrick Garland. Where honestly do you think we are? And do you think there's any chance that the rule of law in America will restrain Donald Trump? I do. So I think that the pressure now, because of the failure, as you say, of the Republican Party to police itself against a demagogue, Um, and Mueller to do the same, is now it's falling on the courts and these different indictments. He's already been indicted in New York 
um, and there's potentially other ones coming. And certainly it seems like the tea leaves are that Jack Smith is running an aggressive uh, investigation that's nearing its final phases. But at least for now, you know, as you pointed out at the beginning, uh, you know, the media seems complicit in giving him a platform. And look, I believe very much in debate and the clash of ideas. And I want to hear a speech from the other side and those with whom we disagree. I think that's truly what makes this country great. But the idea that CNN would give him basically a town hall, I think is a dangerous one. I mean, to quote uh, Taylor Swift on TikTok, this is not your father's Republican Party. Um, this is a guy who's been indicted already, who's stolen highly sensitive documents and kept them, and who, of course, fomented an insurrection on January 6th. And it's a bit surreal for me to think that CNN, in a span of one month, is going to flip its coverage from covering the criminal arraignment of Donald Trump to giving this guy a town hall. Um, I mean, and to Neil's point, Here's what we know he's got to say. I mean, this is his first campaign speech, A.B., in uh, Waco. When you sit at the politicians that work in the United States government, like Mitch McConnell, Nancy Pelosi, Schumer, Biden. So what he says there, we have some bad audio on the feed, but what he says is this. That was his first um, campaign of NAB. It was in Waco um, on purpose. Quote, our biggest threat are high-level politicians that work in the U.S. government. Mitch McConnell, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, Justice Department. For those who have been wronged and betrayed, of which there are many people out there that have been wronged and betrayed, I am your retribution. We will take care of it. It's sort of right there between, like, running for seventh grade class president. You know, I will get you a vending machine. I am on it. Um, and running as, a, you know, to, to lead the mob, the neighborhood mafia chapter. Um, that's what he has to say. He doesn't, he doesn't to his, um, I don't know if we could even call it credit, but he doesn't make secrets of what he wants to use these platforms to communicate. Absolutely. What's been so remarkable as we've watched Ron DeSantis, who is supposed to be the viable alternative to Trump, the person who could take him down, you know, the heartthrob of all the donors and the GOP elites who wanted to get beyond Trump, but who still will not tell us that he cannot be president again. They just say things like he cannot win. They never tell us that, that he shouldn't be president again. So as you've seen that dream of a Trump replacement falter, they've been silent as he said things like, I'll be your retribution. And as he's embraced the January 6th event, the, 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 the cause of, of the prisoners um, playing this bizarre song that they're making money off of at his events, he's going to pardon all of them if he's put back in office. And he's made that quite clear so the lies about the election, the lies about the insurrection are part of his sales pitch in this third campaign, and Republicans are silent on it. So Neil's right. They're the initial gatekeepers. It was up to Mitch McConnell to help the Senate convict him on February 13th of 2021 to end this threat to the constitutional order, and they did not. Then they started to say things like, Trump can't win, but they won't say that he shouldn't. And now... They're just looking away as he dominates the polls, is back on Fox News after a soft ban, and is being normalized. And what's so what's so threatening in terms of the challenge of treating this presidential campaign as as different? What's so difficult is that he will stay the same. He will escalate his lies. I, one of the things I said in a conversation with Charlie Sykes yesterday. In fairness to, to Caitlin Collins, she's a fearless and fantastic journalist, but the management's decision to put him in a town hall where he will lie aggressively and consistently to these undecided voters puts a, a tremendous burden on her, um, which she may meet, to fact check, check, fact check him the entire time. And if not, um, that is a, a, a giveaway um, to Donald Trump and, and, and a gift to Donald Trump, normalizing him not only now on Fox, but on CNN as just another candidate um, who was not Putin's, Putin's puppet, who did not threaten um, the peaceful transfer of power 
who did not um, lie to us while this disease spread throughout our society and killed hundreds of thousands of people before they came clean about it. Um, he almost won that election, Nicole, in 2020 by 44,000 votes in only a few states. So I think it's time for people to sober up about the threat that he continues to present. AB, let me just say, Savannah Guthrie did that same heroic journalistic task of fact-checking everything that he said when, when NBC had a town hall with Trump ahead of 2020. But it's, it's, it is an undue burden on any journalist. And that's not really the point, right? That's not what you were saying, and that's not what I'm saying. It's a bigger conversation about how you cover someone whose embrace of violence was made abundantly clear through a summer of hearings. Pat Cipollone testified. I mean, Cassidy Hutchinson testified, quote, he won't tell them to stop because he agrees with them. What did they want to do? They wanted to, quote, hang Mike Pence. That's who he is. And I think until the, the cruise ship turns its body, you know, turns itself around um, in open waters and covers him as someone who was fine with Mike Pence being hung and murdered, we don't, it doesn't matter how many times you fact check him. He's not a normal politician. He's a would-be, you know, coup plotter who's, who failed because, frankly, of his incompetence. I mean, he had enough people in enough places that if he hadn't been so distracted and incompetent and unorganized, he might have pulled it off. And those insurrectionists' mission that day was to, quote, hang Mike Pence. Right, for which we've never had any evidence that he was... Um... Uh, that he was remorseful about that. And we have not heard from top Republicans um, saying this This is a, a president we once supported who sicked a mob uh, who wanted to kill Mike Pence after his own vice president in a threatening tweet. They will not say, Nicole, that, that he has disqualified himself because of January 6th, Republican electeds and elites. They will not say... Um, that he lost the election. And the Republican National Committee, as you well know, will break the rules for him. He doesn't have to debate if he doesn't want to. He doesn't have to sign a pledge if he doesn't want to. So it's not, yes, the challenge to the media is to try to cover this surreal no man's land where Republican officials themselves will hold him to no account and provide a long runway um, in which he can dominate and play by no rules um, and skirt his way to, to the nomination without challenge. So, Jason, we also are that country that's looking around for somebody else to do it, right? You know, like the alarm's going off outside your apartment, and you're like, well, right. the owner will hear it, and he'll go turn it off. I don't have to deal with it. And but then you think, oh, maybe someone's bringing another alarm goes off. Oh, someone else will deal with it. You know, no one else is coming to deal with Trump, right? No one else is coming. And he's about to, you know, right. be sort of granted the cloak of legitimacy. I, I'm sure CNN won't be the last news organization to host him in a town hall. He is the Republican frontrunner. The rule of law, I, I, I take Neil at his word that he believes that Jack Smith and others may hold him accountable, um, may or may not happen. It, it, in my view, it certainly doesn't seem to be on any schedule to happen ahead of an election. Um, my question for you is, how do the Democrats adjust to the new reality that it is on them to simply beat Donald Trump and all of his enablers in elections? Well... The first part is the Democrats have to recognize that they're actually in war, right? This is, this is, it's the old untouchables thing. If they come with a knife, you got to come with a gun. They come with a gun, you got to come with a cannon. Like the, the Democrats are still operating as if this is a two-party system. It is not a two-party system. I have said this hundreds of times, Nicole, with you. It is, there's no Republican party. It is a dime store front for a terrorist organization. The Democrats have to stop functioning as if they are working with or trying to compete against another party. The Republicans have bought the Supreme Court. The Republicans have said that they explicitly do not care about using violence to influence elections. The Republicans have consistently passed laws to make it difficult for people to vote. So Democrats have to recognize that they don't need any sort of comedy or kindness. They need a wartime consigliere to get through this. And I don't know if they've necessarily realized that. That's step one. Step two, 
use the language of combat. Republicans have been doing it for 20 years. Say we're going to war against bigotry. We're going to war against fascism. We're going to war against the guy who tried to overthrow your country. We're going to war against the incompetent people who run this place. I don't believe the rule of law is going to do anything. I don't think it's going to do anything fast enough, because if it was going to operate fast enough, it would have stopped people who were part of the coup attempt from getting reelected to Congress. We still have people who are part of that coup who now have greater access to security information in 2023 than they did before January 6th in 2021. So the Democratic Party has to function as if they are responsible for governing, they are responsible for keeping this country safe, and they're responsible for putting down an ongoing coup. And until they do that, until people stop believing that the Republicans are going to rein Donald Trump in, because they're not, until people stop believing that media companies are not going to use him for sort of car crash viewership, we will continue to slowly ebb towards an autocracy. And that's not something that any of us want to live in, but I think the Democrats are in a unique position to do something if they recognize the situation they're in. Um, the language of war, that's such an interesting way to put it. Um, someone who has used that um, is Liz Cheney. Let me show you what she had to say about her own party, Neil. The reality that we face today as Republicans, as we think about the choice in front of us, we have to choose because Republicans cannot both be loyal to Donald Trump and loyal to the Constitution. My fellow Americans, we stand at the edge of an abyss and we must pull back. We must pull back. For speaking the truth about her own party, she was first ousted from leadership, um, Neil. Then she served on the January 6th committee, and Matt Gates, among others, um, orchestrated her ouster from her um, seat in Congress. Um, but that is the truth from one of the most conservative Republicans I've ever known in, in my past life in, in Republican politics. How does that inform and animate everybody else? Obviously, it's fallen on deaf ears among Republican elected officials, but I think it had some impact on voters. You saw that in the results of the midterms. And I would hope some impact on policymakers. Yeah, so Liz Cheney is absolutely right that, you know, there's a choice here and the Republican Party uh, so far hasn't listened to her and hasn't made the right one. So they've been AWOL. And Jason's absolutely right, too. The Democrats haven't done enough to treat this as the war against fascism and kind of extremism that it is. Um, and to me, like, you know, there's a tell in Donald Trump. He's actually at bottom a scaredy cat. He's a guy who's like, for example, as the news today shows, he's afraid to debate in his own party. And, mm -hmm. you know, a debate involves the exchange of ideas. And so it's not surprising in a way that Trump is afraid to debate because the only thing Trump exchanges in is insults and fraudulently only obtained cash, as best as I can tell. Um, you know, he reminds me of those kind of college kids who were so afraid to debate, who are afraid to be confronted by an idea with which they disagree. They want to hide in their own bubble. Um, and that's really Donald Trump at his core. And it's OK if you're a college kid. It's not OK if you're seeking to be president of the United States. I mean, this guy's afraid to debate, and he wants to be the leader of the free world um, until he can make it not the free world. I mean, it's um, uh, it's it's very telling to me. And so I do think the kind of things Jason's talking about, about ramping up and calling Trump on this stuff has to happen. And it's not unfortunately happened to the extent it should. Jason, I'll give you the last word. What is your advice? You have to recognize that we're in war and you can't believe in Republicans anymore. I, I literally thought about this just like a couple days ago. Like, imagine a football team, right? If you had a football team where the quarterback, like, sold the playbook to another team, sexually assaulted somebody, and then, like, tried to use a gun to win a game, that team would fire the quarterback. They would get rid of it, right? Like, we would assume that would happen. ESPN would no longer cover that team until they got rid of that quarterback. We have higher standards for an NFL team than we do for the Republican Party because Donald Trump has done all of those things in work and they haven't excommunicated them, but they will get rid of Liz Cheney. We have to stop pretending that Republicans are anything other than terrorists. That's not hyperbole at this particular point. They endorse terrorism. So the moment we start functioning that way, we might be able to save this country. And that's the only answer at this point. Not, par not arguing about the debt ceiling, not arguing, but can you get Matt Gates to vote this out of the other? Recognize you're at war. When the Democrats do that, we might scrape out some semblance of democracy for the next couple years. But I'm not banking on it at this point, because I haven't seen that kind of moxie from anybody in the Democrats. Democratic Party.
This conversation is to be continued. Uh, Neil Katyal, A.B. Stoddard, and Jason Johnson, thank you so much for having it with me and starting us off today.